good evening, church. How you doing tonight? Good. This is the most lively group, this 5 o'clock service. I'm telling you, you know what I'm saying? It's great to see everybody. Hey, this is our second, second week in this series about money, right? And that is what I'm encouraging everybody is if you're newer with us, make sure, especially if you're brand new, that you give us three opportunities to see if this is where God would have you, to have you hear about his word. Who hadn't thought about money this week, right? Who hadn't thought about money this week? So to get into today's sermon, I, wanna, I just want to ask this question. Does anybody have a birthday this month in the month of October? Raise your hand if you had a birthday in October. You kidding me? <laughs> Nobody did. Well, we can't even wish anybody happy birthday. Well, I tell you what, I had some amazing gifts for those, for those people. So on your way out today, I've got a gift for every one of you. When you walk out the doors, people are going to be holding a gift because it is the Oasis's 10-year anniversary. Praise God for 10 years growing His church. After the sermon, we're going to have a brief video about where we came from and what's been going on for 10 years and a snapshot. And we're going to go out. If you got time to hang out, we've got cake. We're going to like, like happy birthday. We're going to hang out, have some coffee, uh, clean up. Oh, well, yeah, I didn't say that, did I? Clean up, right? Like, do whatever we need, but we want to celebrate that. So I want to just uh, pray right now as we open up and thank God for his work in this community and the life of this church. Father, we... Thank you for your love for us. We thank you for sending Jesus to die, to die for the church, that he would build his church, you said. And I pray that for 10 years that you've been working through the life of the body of the Oasis in this community of Pueblo West, I pray that you would just fill us with your spirit to want to serve, fill us with your strength as a church to go out and love our neighbors. And I pray, Father, that we could just tell somebody how you have changed our life. And we pray this. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So I want to continue on this birthday theme uh, idea. So if, if, if your birthday was coming up and I was entrusted to buy your gifts and your friends and your relatives were like, hey, I want you to buy their gifts and they collected all their money and they gave it to me and they gave me, you were so loved, they gave me so much money. Now, I can not only buy you one gift, but I'm going to buy you three gifts, okay? And the first gift that I got you for your birthday is something very special. In fact, is it's an automobile. It's, it's a very nice one in the day. It was like one of the hottest, innovative cars. This is your birthday gift right here. The 1984 Pontiac Fiero. I know some of you probably weren't even alive yet, right? I know you're going to have to take my word for it. Hottest car of the top three automakers. I mean, this had a mid-engine. This was this innovation, and it was the hottest car on the street, literally, because this 1984 Fiero... 20 to 40 of them caught fire a month. You'd go into a restaurant, come back out, and your, fi your car would be, be burned to the ground. And you'd go, if I could find you one of those and give you that, you'd go, what kind of gift is that? That's not a hot car. Well, <laughs> it is a hot car, but I don't want it, right? Okay, strike one, Pastor. So gift number two. So what I want to get you for your second gift is I want to buy you a stock because I want to make you a millionaire. I mean, I mean it, maybe even billions, because this is like hot, innovative, an internet web-based business, and I'm going to, I've bought you stock, and one day it's going to be hot because it is so cool, and you're thinking, what stock is it? Was it Google? Is it Facebook? No, it's this right here. MySpace, right? Let me ask, who, <laughs> who, who have you had in the past a MySpace account? Huh? Right. Okay. You can put your hand. Some people still do. And, and, and they go there today and it's like going to the country kitchen. You're like, why am I even here? What is this thing? But you're not going to make money on that either, is it? Huh? <laughs> you're not going to do it. You're going, well, strike two, preacher. No good. No good. Well, I got a third gift. <laughs> I do. You're going to get to go see one of the hottest entertainers of all time. I mean, it just is. And you're thinking, no, Elvis, no, Elvis is gone. This one, he's left the building. And you're, you're thinking maybe uh, you two, no, Sting, right? You ever heard of that? Sting, no, this is, this is, I've got you four tickets to go see this guy. Vanilla ice, hot stuff, right? 
Vanilla, he was hot in the day, right? <laughs> hot in the day. Now, here's, here's my point. In the day, the Fiero, MySpace, Vanilla Ice were cool, awesome, in the day. And that's my point. This is my point right here. Things that satisfy us in the moment are probably not going to satisfy us tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? Things that are cool today are probably going to be in tomorrow's yard sale or the junkyard of tomorrow, right? The things that satisfy us today probably won't satisfy us tomorrow. But listen, each one of us, I believe, is seeking satisfaction, Christian, non-Christian alike. We are seeking that, that thing that's going to give us that self-worth, that cool thing. And the problem is, many times we seek satisfaction of the things of this world. And so today, if you get nothing else out of this message, if, if you have a bulletin and you're filling that outline in the back, this is what I want you to walk out of here with is this. Point number one, satisfaction is the result of seeking only Jesus first in everything that you do, in everything that you do. Because let's be honest, we, we just laughed at some of the things that used to be cool, right? So if you want satisfaction in life, if you want satisfaction in your career, if you want satisfaction in your marriage, if you want satisfaction in your relationships, if you want satisfaction in, 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 what, in your finances, it's only going to come as a result if you put and seek Jesus Christ first. Last week, we started looking at this as this series about finances, and we looked at First Kings chapter 18, and we're going to turn there again if you want to go ahead and turn there. But we started out talking about the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel we find in the book of Exodus, they were, they were cho God's chosen people, but they were enslaved for about in Egypt for about 450 years. But God rescued them. He, he, he took them out of that situation. He guided them. He provided them. He, he gave them what they needed and took them to a place that, that they couldn't even imagine, just a, a great place that they could have ever wished for. And we said, that's kind of like our story. We've been enslaved in the past. And Jesus Christ set us free, and he set us on this journey. He's guided us. He's provided for us. And, and I think we're blessed, especially here, just by the sheer fact that we live in America. But what happened to Israel? They got to this, they got to this place where God wanted them to be to be free, and they turned their way, their face away from, from God. Now, he was in their top 10 list, but he wasn't number one, but he was in the top. They were still very religious. But God, last week we talked about what? Where does God want to be? He didn't want to just be in our top 10 list. He wants to be where? First place, number one. That's where he wants to be. And in the nation of Israel, because God wasn't first, even though he was in their top 10, he trashed their economy. Literally, he had a prophet named Elijah who was, who was a tish bite from tish B. Praise God. <laughs> then he told, he told Ahab, the king of Israel, he said, look, it's not going to rain in the land for three years. Now, we said last week that this was a land, its whole economy was based on agriculture. And if it doesn't rain for three years, what's going to happen? You're going to lose your job. You're going to like be out. You're not going to have resources. You're going to be out of everything. You're going to be flat broke. So finally, after three years, God tells Elijah, go back to the king and tell him, let's have this challenge. Let's see once and for all, who's God? Are you going to put me back first on your list? Or are you just going to keep me in the top 10 list? That's where we're going to pick up the story this evening. In 1 Kings chapter 18, starting or with verse 20 here. The Bible reads, So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel, not Caramel. And Elijah went before the people and he said, How long will you waver? between two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And here's, here's the line I want you to look at. But the people said nothing. That's what I want you to focus on. The people said nothing. And you know why I think they didn't say anything? Because they were, they were indecisive. They couldn't make up their mind. Now, I've, I've kind of got this 
thing that bothers me, I don't know if it bothers you, but it bothers me sometimes. Sometimes I just need for somebody to make a decision. Like even if it's wrong, it's like, would you just make a decision? And this visited me just not too long ago. My family and I were traveling and we got out of the car to go inside McDonald's just to stretch and, you know, do other things that you need to do when you're traveling inside the restaurant. And we get in line just to get some food. And we're, we're in this long line and I'm on to McDonald's. They serve everybody. There can be 10 cars that make it through the drive through and until you get up there, right? There were some people in front of us. We get up, finally, the cashier says, can I take your order? And the people go, well, what if, and I'm like, do you live in Uzbekistan or something? I mean, are you just visiting America? You should know what you want at McDonald's. Will you just please make a decision? I hope that bothers somebody else. But, but it bothered Elijah. I think on this day right here and God because Elijah stood in front of the people and said, how long are you going to waver between two opinions, between Baal and between the one true God? It's like you followed Baal for three years and how's that going for you in your agriculture-based culture, right? It's not rain in three years. What has he done for you? Can't you just see that the Lord God is God? I mean, he's taken care of you in the past. Don't you think he's going to take care of you again? And the Bible says that they were like, I don't know. <laughs> Let me think about it just a little bit more. So when it comes down to this issue of money, we've got a couple of options, right? We can buy into what the world says about money and finances, or we can listen to God. And do it his way. Use our money the way that he wants us to do it. And I know there are people in the room that, that want to follow Jesus. And for whatever reason, you're like the people in this story. And you're like, I'm kind of indecisive. You know, I'm really, I'm, I just don't know. I just don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can put God first. Uh, this, this leads to point number two, if you're filling out your outline. Bondage is the result of seeking after the things of this world. Bondage results when you don't put Jesus at the top of your list. Jesus said in Mark 4, talks about how the cares of this world pull us away from him. They draw our face away from him. In fact, he says in that context that the deceitfulness of riches can lead us into bondage. So I want to list five reasons that I think we're indecisive when it comes to putting Jesus at the very top of our finances and the first is simply a lack of trust, a lack of trust, a lack of trust. Have you ever met a shady person? I mean, shady. I mean, it's like, you know, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I, I know, right? I went, I went to New York once. And uh, the cool thing about New York, if something bad happens, they're going to sell it on the street. You know what I'm saying? They're creative up there. It's like if nuclear, if a holocaust happens, they're going to like sell nuclear suits so you can like put them on. I mean, they're going to sell that thing. But I, I'm walking in New York across this plaza, and this guy comes to me up and he says, he says, hey, buddy. And I'm like, yeah, what? Yeah? He says, he says it, and he says, do you want to watch? And, and I'm like, yeah, which part? You want to buy a watch? Yeah, he kind of said it like that, you know? Shady character. Just the New York accent alone is shady, right? Jim, our family pastor. And this guy, and this guy, he opens up this like trench coat and has all these watches just hanging there. And he's got fake Rolexes. I've never owned a Rolex, and I learned later that you can tell a fake from a real one really easily. And uh, I said, well, how much? And he says, 50 bucks. And I'm, I'm looking at him, and I go, hey, I'll give you 20 bucks for this watch. Sold, and he walks off, and I'm like, oh. And I just felt kind of dirty like I'd done a drug deal or something, you know what I'm saying? Because this guy was shady. I mean, he was weird. It was, it was a shady situation. I don't know if you've ever been or met a shady person or been in a shady situation, especially when it comes to money. But we can have a lack of trust because of that experience, because what have we all seen? We've all heard about the shady church. We've all heard about the, the shady shyster kind of guy on television. We've heard of the shady nonprofit that it turns out we, we learn what they're doing with their money. We've, we've all learned about that, right? Uh, my wife and I, uh, and I, I can tell you, I, I've had difficulty in the past uh, with this trust issue when it comes to 
where people are using what I think is God's money. But, but my wife and I got to know a couple here in the community through our gym, and, uh, and they started coming to church here, and they went to the Blong class, our membership class back in February. And uh, we do a thing, a 90-day tithe challenge, um, and, and we offer that up in our class. And, and after that class, that couple just started tithing. And, and uh, I mean, incredible tithers through the years, started giving 10% of their income. And, and I filled out a card, and I knew about that. And, and, um, and they, they left about, about uh, seven, eight days ago and moved to Michigan. You know, hated to see them leave. And, and I asked them, I said, what was it? that when you stepped over and you filled out that card and you decided to tie, I mean, you came for a while. What, what is it? I mean, you guys were such faithful givers. And they told us an incredible story about how they were a part of the church before, way before they moved here. And uh, the, some of the practices in the church were kind of shady. And they talked about that. And they said, when we came here, you know, it was hard to try. I mean, they, they, it was hard for them just to come back to church because of the shady experience that they had. But they, they came back and and it took them a while until they came to the Blong class and learned about how we uh, try to do everything we can to have integrity with our money, how we, how we receive it, how we spend it, how we give it away. And they said, when we, when we learned that, we just jumped in and became, became tithers. Incredible story. And, uh, and that's why here at, at the Oasis, we try to, to be above board with everything of financially, um, here we, we produce a, a quarterly statement, financial statement that goes out because I know that's very important for people to see. And if you don't get that, we, we try to send that in the mail. If you don't get that, want to get that, fill out a Connect card and let us know, hey, this is my address, I'd like to get that. Uh, we may need to update our records or something like that. And we also have them available at the connecting point out there. But in the Belong class, we go deeper with how we uh, do that, how we spend money and how we try to have integrity in all areas with that. And uh, we had an audit done last year, and, and we take painstaking efforts to try to uh, make sure that, that everything is, is done correctly. I'm telling you, when you have an auditor in it, it is painful <laughs> to, to have that uh, done like that. But, but a lack of trust is huge when it comes to putting Jesus first in our finances. Point B, drive-by guilting. It's the second reason why we don't put Jesus first in our finances. I don't know if you've ever seen an actual drive-by or not or know what that is, but they're scary if you've ever seen something like that. But drive-by guilting sometimes happens right here in church, and maybe it's happened to you here in this church, and I'm sorry about that if it has. But, but drive-by guilting is when you show up and a sermon's preached or something is said, and you feel so guilty, you're motivated to do something out of guilt. And guilt is just not the best motivator when your heart's not in us. It's, it's, it's just not. And let me illustrate. Husbands, if, if, you're, if your wife guilts you into doing something to the outside of the house or yard work and you're out there doing it, you're probably not thinking very loving thoughts to her in that moment, right? You're just like, let me get it done. Because guilt isn't the best motivator. So when I'm up here preaching or teaching on money... It's amazing how some people will jump right in because they've got that guilt factor and they give two or three weeks, but that tapers off quickly because their heart's not in it. After two or three weeks, they just drop off. And, and uh, some people can even be bitter by that when they feel like they've been guilted into giving something because the motivation isn't love. And that's what we, we, we don't want something from you. We want something for you. And this, this thing is a matter of the heart. And that, that's one of the reasons, frankly, that we limit what we ask for. I mean, we want to help the community in so many ways. But we try to limit that. Like this month, we had, um, still today, love in action. We were just asking everybody they needed an extra supply of food for various reasons. And we're like, hey, we're going to get the word out. We got the bin out there. But we don't do that all the time. Coach for kids. We try to limit those asks because we don't just want to guilt guilt, guilt you into giving. We want you to see the needs and be able to give from the heart. The third reason that we're indecisive has to do with fear. I mean, money and fear, they go hand in hand. And what you fear often controls you. It does. After last week's sermon, I had a couple go home and the wife said, look to her husband, look, you know, I want to start tithing. He's going like, are you kidding me? We don't have enough money to tithe. And she started adding it up. She said, you know how much money we spend frivolously? And they started calculating that and looking at that. But fear, 
Fear is legitimate because people go, what if I cannot trust God with my money? But here's what I want you to understand. If you're, if you're going to trust God about the verses about heaven in this book, we've got to trust him about the verses about money. And he says so much about money in this book. Fourthly, debt. Being in debt is another reason we're so indecisive about wanting just to follow God in this area of finances. I, I, there, there are people in this church that are likely massively in debt. And I mean up to your eyeballs, like in debt. And for years, I mean, there are people probably thought transferring balances on credit cards was like, hey, this is the way that I'm going to do it, right? So maybe you went to a, a payday loan company. Maybe you're upside down in your car payment. You know what I'm saying? But people are in debt. And here's what I know about people in debt. Some people got there through serious circumstances. I mean, out of their control. Maybe they lost a job. Maybe the health broke. Maybe they had to take care of an aging parent, but they're flat broke because of circumstances. But a lot of people get into debt. Why? Because of bad decisions. People are trying to finance lifestyles that they simply cannot afford. And listen, if, if, you're, if you're in debt, if you're in debt up your eyeballs, you are not walking in the will of God. And it's like, how can you say that to me, preacher? I'm just reiterating what the Bible says. Let me read for you what it says in, in Proverbs 22 and verse 7. It says, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender, or slave to the lender. That's pretty heavy when we think that that's where our pull and our focus becomes. And as followers of Jesus, as followers of Christ, we are to be his servants we're not to be slaves to MasterCard and Visa and American Excess. And if we're enslaved to them, it's going to take our eyes off of Jesus, I'm telling you. But the good news is, if you're in debt like that, we're, we want to help you with that absolutely free. We really do. We would really love for you guys, our connect groups. What's a connect group? We go meet in homes. There might be eight people. There might be 18 people. You can get connected. We've only had one and we can start on our second one. And what you would be committing to is five weeks of about 90 minutes of your time each time just to learn this thing to get out of debt. And look, if, if you've already learned about finances and maybe you're not in debt at all, I would encourage you as well to jump in and get involved in one of these connect group for two reasons. One is because of your testimony. There are people that are going to these groups that have done it. They've gotten up out of debt. You've gotten up out of debt, and there's people that need to hear that testimony. And if you go to that group, you might be the testimony to allow somebody to hear that because you've done it. And they'll go, you know what, I think I can do it too. The second reason I love for you to get connected, even if you've already done Dave Ramsey or whatever it is, to, to jump into a group because the Bible talks about the church, and the church is not just learning about Jesus. It's participating in life together with Jesus. Like today, I got a call uh, from a, a family in this church. Their 45-year-old son died. And you know who they were calling? They were calling their connect group for prayer. And people just rallied around them to support them and pray for them. So one of the, one of the calls of the church is, is to fellowship together. And one of the mottos of this church is we cannot do life alone. And I really believe that because if you don't get connected to the church somehow, you're going to end up never getting connected wherever you go. You're really just going to be hanging on the fringes. So I'm asking that you would just get connected just for these five weeks. And... Uh, Register today. Uh, we got a connect table out here. We, we can sign you up. You can check it out. Jim's going to be out there. You can talk to him what group might fit me best. And if you cannot, if you're like, there's no way I can go to a connect group. I want to be in a hospital for the next five weeks. If that's you or if you're just too stubborn to go, I want to get this information into your hands. We provide, we as a church think so strongly about this, especially this issue of debt, that we want to get you out absolutely free. If you cannot or will not go to a connect group, on the way out, we got books out here. We got books and a workbook. So you get two books. We bought one that, that, that can go to every family in the church. 
if you'll just like sign your name and your social security number and your life away, I'll give you a book for, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I do want you just to sign your name so we can track our books. And we'll give you this stuff for free because we think it is so important to be able to put Jesus Christ first in your life, especially if you're struggling in this area of debt. This book is designed to help get us out of that. So we just want to come alongside and help you do that as a church, our family of believers, just to do that together. Point E, unawareness. Unawareness. People are indecisive about, okay, I want to go after the things of this world, or can I really put Jesus Christ first in my life? Unawareness is part of the problem. Because there's people who go, Greg, here's the deal. When I start making more, I'm going to start giving. I really am. But Jesus says in Luke chapter 16, it doesn't work that way. If you're not giving now, you're not going to give then. It's like the teenager. If you've ever given your teenager a car, it'd be like you giving your teenager a car. And, and the teenager comes to you and go, can you just give me something better? This is a clunker. I know I've only wrecked it five times. I, I know I don't come home at curfew when you ask me. But if you bought me a BMW, I'd do it all just right. Okay, okay, we'll buy you a meal. No, God says it's like the same thing. And, and, and we think, you know what? Those giving passages of the Bible, they don't apply to me because they're talking about rich people. You ever read, read all those? It talks about rich people. That's not me. I'm not rich. Let's look at one of those passages right now, okay? First Timothy chapter 6 says this. It reads this. Teach. Those who are rich. Well, he's not talking about me, is he? No, he is talking about you. Those who are rich in this present world, not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, the stock market, <laughs> but to provide their hope, to, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for what? For our enjoyment. It's okay to spend money. It's okay to enjoy things, isn't it? He says, teach them and it's like everybody's going, he's going to get those rich people, isn't he? Remember, he's really talking to us. Teach them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take, look at this, they may take hold of life, of the life that is truly life. Because here's what I know. We cannot take hold of life, especially in the area of finances, until we put Jesus Christ at the top of the list. So I want to illustrate for you who think, you know what, the Bible is just talking about those rich people. They're not talking about me. I think everybody in this room, I think we probably have some rich people problems. So I thought about this, and I've got some illustrations of what I think are some rich people statements. Okay, you, you ready for this? I just want to talk about a few of these things that are rich people problems, okay? The first one, Starbucks messed up my venti ice, skinny hazelnut, macchiato, sugar-free syrup, extra hot, light ice, no whip drink. They did it again. That's a rich person problem. By the way, that came off of Starbucks' most obnoxious drink order list, by the way. But can we all agree that's a rich person problem? And there's somebody right here that might be giggling and snickering today because you know the Starbucks has messed up your drink too, right? Rich person problem number two. The internet on my cell phone is so stinking slow. If it, it, that's a rich person problem. If you've ever said that, you're probably rich. Number three. My Asian Palm Civet Droppings coffee tastes off <laughs> as it should. Now, if you don't get this at all, you got to go listen to last week's sermon on this subject because that right there, my friend, is a rich person problem. So check that out if you don't know what we're talking about. Next one, pay at the pump isn't working. I mean, how, isn't it just, you ever get up and slide your credit card in there and that thing doesn't work and you got to drive all the way around to the other pump? That, can we agree? That's a rich person problem. Next one. I don't know what shoes to wear with this outfit. Guys, don't elbow her. Don't, don't do it. But that, that, can we, is that a rich person problem? It is, isn't it? Next one. The food in the fridge went bad. 
and I had to throw it away. Or we used to give it to our dog till it developed stomach ulcers, and we got to give him Pepsi now, so we don't. But you know what? I, I have traveled in multiple countries, multiple third world countries. They don't even have a clue of what that would mean because that's a rich person problem. Next one. They put a pickle on my chicken sandwich, and I want a new one right now. Right now. It can, is that a rich person problem? It is, isn't it? I mean, there are people who would love to have pickle juice on a bun just to have that flavor. You know what I'm talking about? That is a rich person problem. And all I'm trying to say is we're blessed. And when we say, no, I'm not rich, that doesn't apply to me, we're, we're kind of missing out on what Scripture talks about when it's talking about us to be obedient. Because the problem occurs in Christianity when we take this idea of obedience and we turn it into optional. And any time that we take obedience and make it an option, we're in, for, we're in for difficulty. We're in for bondage. We really are. Something that God said to do is to put him first, even in this area of finances. And when we don't, it, I'm telling you, it leads to bondage every time. And that's where we're going to pick up the rest of this portion of scripture that we're reading in today from 1 Kings 18 and verse 22. It, we'll just read through these verses right here. It says, Elijah, and right here, what's happening here is, is Elijah's trying to get them out of that indecisive state. And they're having a showdown between the false prophets and God. And he says, Elijah said to them, look, I'm the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us, he said. Let them choose the false prophets for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the altar on the wood, but not set fire to it because he knew they were going to try to cheat. I'll prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I'll call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. He's kind of got their attention a little bit going through here. But quick question, we're talking about fire. It hadn't rained here for three years. What's the last thing you want scorching the earth? Fire, right? So there's something really deeper going on than just this miracle of fire. We're going to talk about that next week a little bit. And the point that I want to make is this, is that God is always doing something extra behind the scenes that we really never detect sometimes that I think that he really wants us to see. Verse 27, um, or verse 20, where am I at, where am I at, Roger? Verse 25. And all the people said, what you said is good. Let me just jump down to verse 27. <laughs> I know, right? At noon, at noon, so they're, they're going through this, they're dancing around. At, at noon, Elijah began to taunt these guys, these false prophets. Shout louder, he said. Surely Baal is God. Perhaps he's deep in thought, or maybe he's busy. The literal translation is he's probably in the bathroom, or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until the blood flowed. They cut themselves in pursuit of answers, these false gods. And I'm telling you what, cutting is a problem still, is a problem today. And there are sociologists, psychologists that are like going, what's the root of this problem? When did this start? What's this phenomenon? Look, this is something that's been going on for thousands of years because when Jesus Christ isn't first in your life, we're going to be held in bondage by a lot of things. And I know there are a lot of people today that abuse their bodies and they even cut for various reasons. They abuse their bodies in a variety of other ways. And if you cut or if you're abusive to your body, I want you to know that Jesus Christ went to the cross and died because he valued you and you alone. If you were the only one on the face of this earth, Jesus Christ died for you, and he loves you, and he doesn't want you to abuse your body. That's why he gave his life to you. Anytime that we take our eyes off of Jesus, and we look at the things of this world to try to satisfy our deepest needs. When we do that, 
we're going to get hurt. And especially in this area of finances, which is so common, when we do not put Jesus first in our finances, we're going to do stuff with our money that's going to make us feel foolish. We're going to make mistakes. And it's just not going to go well. We're going to be in bondage. At verse 29, midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the, name, until the time for evening sacrifice came. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. There are probably people in homes and apartments that are frantically prophesying some heavy stuff because they're going, why am I so broke? Like these prophets. Because you're always going to be in bondage when you take Jesus Christ out of that position number one. So don't miss this. Baal didn't answer because Baal was a false god. He was a god that was made up because people were trying to find satisfaction in worldly things. <clears throat> they were just creating him. And I think it's just a, a, an incredible example of how things of this world, they're just never going to satisfy us. Only when we seek Jesus Christ Will we be satisfied? You, you want to be satisfied and escape the bondage that's heading in front of you? Maybe it's in a relationship. Maybe it's in a marriage. You want to escape the bondage and have freedom in your career? You want to have freedom in your finances and not live in bondage? We got to put Jesus Christ at the top of that list. Now, a lot of people decided to do that last week. They decided, you know what? These guys have just done it for three years in our story. There, there's people who have been trying to do it for years and years and years. And the whole of this message summed up today is it's just not going to work if you try to do it on your own and you don't put Jesus first. And he is pleading today, will you put me first in your life? And maybe you've experienced these five areas. When it comes to finances, there's just a lack of trust, there's fear, you know, one day I'm going to do it, and we've just never quite gotten that right because we're unaware. And I'm not saying if you put Jesus Christ first right now, everything's going to be okay tomorrow. He'll walk with you, though, through that. He'll give you the strength through that. Your hope will shift, and you will have hope in your life if you do that, even if your circumstances don't change. But let me ask tonight what I did last week. Where is Jesus Christ? in your top 10 list? And do you need to make any adjustments in that? Would you pray with me right now? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we come to you this evening. And Father, we have looked at the Israelites. And I know when I read the story about these guys and think that they were in bondage for 450 years and how you guided them to promise, that you guided them to freedom and you provided for them. And they, like, turned their face away. I giggle because I'm like, how can that happen? And oh, God, I see how I do that in my own life. And I know there are people here today and it's not that we have turned our backs on you, but we've just kind of don't have you as number one. Maybe it's number three. Maybe it's number five. Maybe you're in the eighth slot. And I, I know just like the famine, just like the, just like the, the arid time, the, the drought that we're in these people's lives, I pray that as you try to get their attention through that, that maybe today you're trying to get our attention through some of those circumstances that we don't quite understand, that perhaps we're in bondage to something right now because we just don't have you first. And I pray that I would hear that message. I pray that each of us would hear that message. And with every head bowed, every eye closed, I, I, if God spoke to you and said, look, you, I, I want you to put me first and you need some, somebody to come alongside you in that, it doesn't have to be in finances, it can be in whatever, relationships, a job, maybe you just need to pray for something that you're trying to make a decision upon. Right now, we, got, we have prayer people, prayer warriors in the lobby because they've been there. 
and they'd like to pray with you or for you right now if you want that opportunity. And I'd ask you, you can just move out of your aisle right now and just tap the person if you've got to get by somebody. Maybe you've not truly received Jesus. And you need to pray with somebody about that, tell somebody about that, because it's like tonight, I've heard you, oh Lord, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this thing. Like when I first came to Christ, I made God a deal. I said, God, I want to give you a year. I want to give you a year. I want to do, pull out all the stops. I want to go after you. Maybe tonight in same fashion, you're like, if I could just give you a week, oh Jesus. If I could give you a month, let me just do this and see how you answer. If that's you, I'd encourage you to go back and pray with somebody. And ask God to give you strength along the way through the fellowship of his church. How he designed it. He never designed it that we would do life alone. He never designed it that way. Nothing in this world is going to last, just like my space. <laughs> but today, I'm telling you, you can put your hope in something that will last, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for, for your promises. We thank you for the hope that you're able to provide instantly how you can lift our spirits when we turn to you, when we put you in that first slot. And I pray, Father, that you are awesome. You are worthy of our praise. Nothing on this earth is more worthy than you are. I pray that we could give you that praise and recognition in our life. If everybody agreed, said, amen, amen, in the name of Jesus. And we're going to, uh, just in a minute, we're going to check out a video of our history. And I just want to encourage you. If you haven't gotten connected with a group, if you'd like a set of books on your way out, grab those that are right to the right on a table as you go out through there. And hang out and have some birthday cake. Celebrate our birthday. I'll see you guys later.